So I'm going to be taking up two questions that came in when we asked, we posted something a few weeks ago, um, asked Jennifer anything, and a lot of questions came in, but um, we will be looking at two different things. One is a question that came in in a lot of different iterations, which is how do you teach or support children in creating moderate healthy relationships? to their appetites, meaning sexuality, food, video games, and other electronics. And this person went on to say, Jennifer's last interview struck a chord. I totally see how shame creates compulsion. How do we help our children set limits without disapproval shame, and shame sneaking in? Um, okay, great. So, so let me just, I'll talk about it in terms of pornography, but I'll also talk about it in terms of just in general going in a compulsive way to behaviors that can offer some soothing in the immediate sense, but create a lot of trouble ultimately. And the first thing I would say is that what we tend to do is we tend to shame the behavior as if the behaviors created the problem rather than looking at what's going on inside the child that the problem exists, right? Because, uh, for example, a child can be in relationship to video games either in a way that is just a part of their good life, that they're creating good life and they sometimes uh, play video games, or they can relate to video games in a way that it's like hijacking their lives. The problem isn't the video games per se, which is not me saying that there isn't an element to them that is designed to draw your children in and to keep them connected to it. There is, that's why all of us walk around with our phones. <laughs> these, these phones are designed to try and exploit uh, our own tendencies to do what's immediately rewarding, immediately feels good, and interferes with more organic processes that are really valuable to the human experience, right? So. I'm not denying the um, capacity of things like pornography and video games and food that's even in, you know, fast food is designed to exploit our, um, you know, it, high sugar, high fat. Um, and so th that definitely is there. And part of creating a healthy society is addressing the ways that uh, products are designed to exploit our vulnerabilities as human beings and make our quality of lives go down. So that's that's there. Um, for now, we can't do a lot about that, but what we can do is think about how do we help ourselves and help our children be less vulnerable to being exploited by these processes or address what's vulnerable within us. Um, so. What I would say is that all of us, and our children included, are much more likely to go to these repetitive self-soothing behaviors that don't make our lives better ultimately when we have high anxiety or feel bad about ourselves. And by anxiety, I don't mean that you're gripped with fear per se, you may not even be aware of feelings of fear, but you are unsettled, you're not comfortable in your own skin, you may feel bad about yourself, anxious about the world you're in, feeling too little self-efficacy, too little ability to impact your environment, feeling that the world is meaningless. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways that this can get expressed, but you are basically not comfortable in your own skin. And when you're not comfortable in your own skin, you're going to be vulnerable to things that make you feel comfortable in the immediate sense but interfere with your overall happiness. They may take anxiety down immediately, but create more anxiety ultimately. And so this is a really easy thing for us as human beings to do, and we must actively work against it if our lives are gonna be better. Um, so what I think you wanna think about is if you see your child, okay, we're gonna pretend for a moment that we're all good with this. <laughs> that we don't struggle with these things. Uh, and we're just here to help our children, okay? Um, I'm kind of teasing because actually to be effective in helping your children, you have to deal with yourself first on this front. But let's just focus on the kids for a minute and then we can back it up and look at ourselves. Um, but I think if you see a child who's engaging in maladaptive behaviors, whether that's they're looking at pornography, they're playing too many video games, they're, they're eating food compulsively, substance abuse problems are the same thing. 
um, that you want to confront what's happening in my child's life that this makes sense for them to turn to this. Where, what is the source of the anxiety or the discomfort with themselves? Now, a very obvious place to look that many of us do not look is what it's actually like to live in our own homes. To live in the homes that maybe we are, because we're the parents, are accustomed to, that we have justified or blamed our partner for, but that we don't really uh, recognize sufficiently um, that we don't recognize sufficiently how much we are participating in the high anxiety that's in the family. Um, so, sorry, John, I'm in a recording. Yeah. So, um, so, um, so at that that can be more a part of the the environment than you can really track. Sometimes when, as a therapist, when I'm looking at the families that people have grown up in, it's unbelievable the amount of anxiety that that child has to handle. The covert and overt hostility between the parents, for example, the attempts at control from parent to child, the ways that they feel devalued in the family, the way that siblings treat them. I mean, there can be sometimes enormous amounts of anxiety and it's no shocker that that child goes and finds comfort in something like pornography, or they find comfort in food, or comfort in you know social media, uh, because there's really no room to have a self in that home environment. And what can feel normal to us is often much more toxic than we can see. And a lot of times in therapy, what I'm doing or in coaching, I'm helping people to awake it, to wake themselves up to what it is that they both grew up in and that they're recreating in their own homes. Um, so I think that's one piece to really look at is, is, is this an environment that a child can be at peace within? And if not, what's my role in creating a space where it's hard for them to belong to themselves, to be in their own skin and be with me? The second thing to think about is you may have a child that is more on the anxious side, that has more difficulty self-regulating. Even if you have a very peaceable home life, um, you can have a child that struggles to self-regulate and struggles to deal with their own fears. So they may have difficulty stepping towards the things that are hard for them. And this is a big factor in depression because, you know, there are um, biological aspects of depression that the brain may be more likely to do depression given uh, your own biological inheritance. But there's also aspects that I think are there, which is that if you tend to step away from difficult things to self-regulate uh, and you can't tolerate the anxiety of of, um, of your own incompetency or your own inability, well then it creates more anxiety and more depression. So it becomes self-reinforcing. If I um, am, uh, don't feel that I'm good at, uh, in my social skills and therefore I step away from social interaction and go to video games or something else, you know, then you may have immediate comfort, but then your sense of being inefficacious has now gone up. And then you feel even more afraid of it, more likely to go to the comforting behavior, and you feel more depressed and more unable. Right? So probably the greatest skill that anybody can have in many respects is the willingness to tolerate, to be of a growth mindset, to be willing to think about their inability uh, and tolerate it enough to put themselves into situations that pressure their development and pressure them to get better at something. Again, that's really hard. You have to tolerate discomfort and we don't like discomfort as human beings and our brains will push us against discomfort. Our brains will push us towards the things that we like and we know. But, um, but if you repeatedly step back, you will be more and more likely to get depressed and then it's harder and harder to step towards the difficult thing. Okay, so again, you may have a child who's more on the anxious side, more on the self-betraying um, side, meaning they may not even know it. Those that can tolerate more anxiety will tend to grow more. 
and it's a, it's a hard thing because your child may even be wired up to sort of step back and that's that's hard so so again you want to look at what's going on in the child and then you want to normalize uh, so this is, I'll get to porn specifically in a minute or sexuality and, and how our own shaming of these things can play a role. But I think the first step is to discern what's happening rather than shaming the child or seeing them as defective. Why are they doing what they're doing? And then to normalize the behavior. Okay, that is normalize that it makes sense that you're, that you find sexual images compelling. It makes sense that uh, you like the comfort of eating dessert. It makes sense that you like spending so much time on screens because it's got a self-reinforcing aspect to it. And, um, and so that's, that's not strange. It also makes sense that you don't want to step towards the things that terrify you or you feel unable to do or if the family's highly anxious. It makes sense that you don't want to be with all of us. <laughs> We're a tough crowd to be with, okay, if that's true. And so to normalize the, what the child is trying to do has a, a real sense to it. And then to offer that it the cost of continuing in that behavior to help the child see what the cost is if they keep going to the thing that feels immediately reinforcing, as normal as that may be in the human experience, and what it is that the discomfort of going against that, but what it will create for them. Right, so it's getting it out of the frame of pathologizing, it's getting it out of the idea that somehow they're wrong for being drawn to these more uh, immediately rewarding things, um, and but helping them see the cost to themselves, right? Because, for example, I've worked with clients, well, adolescent clients who've been in homes that are highly controlling. And, um, and so what they'll do sometimes is go to a behavior that's uh, covertly rebellious as a way of belonging to themselves. You know, and um, I've seen this with a lot of people who've had a sort of compulsive pornography use, that it's a way of saying, I'm gonna go do the thing that I know is absolutely forbidden in this highly controlled family environment as a way of knowing that I am not being controlled in this way. And so it's really easy in those families to go in and shame the child for looking at the pornography, shame them for sneaking off into the basement to, to look or watch something, look at something or watch something rather than what would it be about this environment that would make them want to do that? How is this a, an adaptive response in some respect? And that takes more of a self-confrontation and more of a look at what's the bigger picture here. Because if you just go in and shame the behavior alone, then you've, got, you've given your child a double, um, how to say it, you've given them both the sense that I'm defective for doing what I'm doing and yet I want desperately to do it. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling process that drives self-hatred as well as the ongoing desire to do it, right? So I'm sure there's a more articulate way to say that, but you know, a lot of the people I have worked with as adults that are in compulsive sexual behavior, it's the idea that they can get away with doing it, that they can make something happen, they can go to the peep show, they can do this thing that's forbidden. And they've often said that that process itself is where the high is, that actually like observing the sexual content or whatever is not as rewarding as they anticipated. It's somehow the idea that they got away with it is the compelling part. And that often comes out of high anxiety, highly controlled homes. I'm just gonna see what, he says, thank you for this video, you're welcome. He says, I don't tolerate anxiety well. I'm trying to exercise that muscle when I try and stay in it with my children. Um, when my children are behaving anxiously, I have a hard time with self-regulation and have found myself yelling or blowing up. How do I stay in it and keep control of myself? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, this issue of self-regulation in parenting, it's like the master class in learning how to do it because, you know, especially when we're all in together in the same space and a child's not doing what you think they ought to do and your anxiety starts going up and being able to handle yourself is 
challenging, right? I mean, a lot of us have a hard time handling ourselves when there's nobody around, <laughs> much less, you know, people that we think should be behaving in different ways or reflecting on us in some way. So I think that, um, um, uh, so to your question, what I would say is that it's just a skill to be developed. And I think one of the important skills is recognizing when you aren't self-regulated. Don't go in and try and address something out of that state of anxiety because you feel smarter than you are. You feel like you know more what needs to happen than you do. And you are gonna go in and infect your child or infect your marriage. So just tracking that you're trying to get better at it but you're not succeeding is really valuable in and of itself and seeing can I remove myself from the situation enough and self confront enough and I talk about this a lot in the in the strengthening your relationship course of what you can do in that moment to pull back and get more able to self regulate so you can come back to it when you're in your wiser brain when you're in your more self regulated place because not only are you wiser when you're self-regulated, but you aren't infecting your child and, and having a situation blow up. And I've seen this again and again in my own life. Like if I may think I'm self-regulated, but in fact, I may be being stoic, okay? Or like trying to handle my own frustration, but my kids can track that like, like so easily. And so it's still infecting. Where when I'm really self-regulated, then I can really see my child's functioning come up and we're more able to solve something together. Um, okay, so this is greatly helpful. I can already see how this applies to behavior in several of my children and how I can observe with more compassion and clarity. That's wonderful. So, um, so I would, to your question, I would just keep thinking of it as a skill you can get better and better at. And I think something that really, really helps is having pauses in your life where you are moving into deeper self-regulation. Um, I talked about this just on a podcast I did this last week, which will get released next week, about, you know, I think the value of being in nature as a way of finding kind of calm and a kind of internal anchor, relaxing more deeply into uh, the animal of your being, to quote a poet, and I can't remember who said that. Uh, come to me. But, you know, to basically settle down in your own skin. That's what meditation is. That's what, you know, I talk about in the Enhancing Sexual Intimacy course of doing the hug, one of Dr. Schnarch's um, techniques of learning how to self-regulate deeply. It is a real skill and it takes real patience, but you can get better and better at it. And the more you can do it when you are uh, on a yoga mat or do it when you are in nature or do it when you are in an embrace with your partner, which is higher level, right? the more you will find your ability to do it in a moment of higher anxiety in a relational conflict or issue. And my basic advice on that is to distrust yourself. And I know that sounds terrible, like we're supposed to trust ourselves, but I basically distrust myself around certain issues that I know they tend to get me triggered, they tend to get me a little worked up, and I tend to come in with my less effective self. So I, I try to say like, this is not a trustworthy, I'm not trustworthy yet in this place. So I have to really, before I come towards it, go calm myself down, be thoughtful about it, think about what my role is in it, and then see if I can go back towards it from my better self. And I think what can help is particularly around certain kinds of relational dynamics or challenges or things that are, that are typically challenging for you is to have these anchor points that remind you, what is my goal? What do I desire? Um, for me with a particular pattern with one of my kids, there's a book that I read that was very helpful for me. So sometimes just like, I'm just gonna listen to that for 20 minutes because it just gets me into the right mindset, reminding me of important things that my brain will let go of in the moment of anxiety. So, so again, it's finding your sort of baseline and your wiser self. There's a lot of questions, so let me see. Uh, oh, let me see one second. Um, Yes, it says, thank you. I thought the answer could be hard work. Yes, okay. Um, yes, it is. Bummer of it all. Um, a helpful mantra when trying to self-regulate while I'm around my uh, ch child is I am calm and engaged. I, so that's great. I think saying what it is that you are or that you want is much better than don't do X, Y, Z to yourself. 
So to say, you know, I don't do that. I'm not the kind of person who does that. I'll say that to myself. It actually, there's research that helps. Even like, oh my God, kind of am, I kind of do do that. <laughs> but I'm asserting like, no, I do this. This is how I am. This is what I do. And it gives your mind what it is you are walking towards. I remember being at a at an intersection with my oldest child who um, is on the autism spectrum and has a lot of self regulation challenges or has had he's come a long way but I remember he was about four years old we were standing on a busy road uh, and I was saying to uh, I can't remember who it was another adult that was there a woman we were standing there at the road and I said Graham has gotten so much better he doesn't jump into the road anymore and immediately he did the thing he heard me say which is instead of processing the negative into the positive form of he stands next to me <laughs> he did the thing he heard right thankfully I quickly grabbed him and pulled him out of the road uh, but it's just interesting with him so much what I would do is just offer the behavior that was desired because it gave less for his brain to have to translate and turn into the positive and uh, that's true for us as well. Okay, I'm gonna kind of quickly have to see. It says, how do you balance them seeing your raw emotions, mom's upset, angry, and owning your mistakes with your kids versus being strong for them? I don't want them to feel like they need to caretake me, accommodate me when I'm upset, but I also think it's good for them to see their parents as human. Yeah, uh, so definitely kids can see you as human, uh, but you are co constantly self-confronting that you are responsible. So like pretending that you are not dysregulated, it doesn't really work. They already track it and they're already wiring up to that reality. They, they can't help it. It's, they are dependent on your mind. And so stoicism or masking is not necessarily helpful. Uh, of course, being indulgent with your emotions and your anger and your feelings is also not helpful. So what you want is to keep reminding yourself of your responsibility to handle your reality so that they don't have to. And I think the more that you are reminding yourself of that responsibility, the more that balance will be there. They'll see that you're human. I mean, there's no getting around that. Uh, they'll see that you're human and they'll see that you are taking responsibility for yourself, whether that's in the form of an apology to them if needed, or that you are self-correcting and coming back to something in a better way. They will see mom's got this. She's taking responsibility for herself so I don't have to, even though she's a work in progress. It also gives them permission to be works in progress themselves. Okay, I'll take one more and then I'm gonna, um, what book did I find helpful? It's called, uh, hang on, it's called, oh, He's Not Lazy. Uh, so it's just about adolescent boys and their development and, and basically the issue of uneven development in a child and how that can show up in terms of motivation, self-regulation, um, and so on. So it's, it's, it's a more specified parenting book, but relevant for uh, my situation. Um, let's see, let's see. Yes, would you say that if you learn to regulate your own anxiety that our children's anxiety will just naturally fall also? Yes, I mean, they still have their developmental tasks that they need to do, but I'll just give this example. I hope I don't regret giving it. <laughs> I also want to protect my children a little bit from their own, you know, their privacy. But when my daughter was maybe nine years old, um, we she's a she's a quite a talented musician, and we got in with his violin teacher that was really hard to get in with, and I was really excited about it, and um, and I was just anticipating this was going to be a great fit and was going to really work well, and my daughter just didn't like her, and the worst in my daughter would come out in these lessons, and I couldn't handle it. <laughs> it's just really hard for me because I could tell the violin teacher didn't really enjoy working with her and I was also seeing a kind of regressive immature kid show up to the lessons and then I would try to talk to her about it after the lesson sort of in a 
I don't know what the right language is, but kind of in a tamped, overly controlled way, like I'm trying to be control, controlled because I knew that I was really getting worked up. And even though I looked controlled, she could map that I was not happy with her, that I didn't like how this was going, and she would get more and more sort of emotional and worked up, which would make me feel more contempt, to be honest, towards her behavior and what she was doing. So, and then the teacher was starting to email me like, I don't know if this is working and I don't, you know, know why this isn't coming together and which was of course not calming me down. So, um, it took me a while to figure out that I was pretending to be self-regulated when in fact I wasn't and that I needed to look at what was happening in me in this interaction because I was a part of this threesome you know like it wasn't just the teacher and my daughter I was in those lessons and how was I a part of this bad dynamic and um, so I started self confronting that always always helps with self regulation even though it's never fun to do that but like what would it be like to be my daughter in these lessons and who am I? Okay, well, I'm kind of a high pressure presence because I'm like, it's hard to get in with this teacher. We better go well, you know, I mean, come on Jane, show her what you know and show her that you're so good at this and all that kind of garbage. And I think that was just, my daughter could track, that's where I was, that I was getting unclear about who this was about and I think she felt a lot of performance anxiety, which she was sort of pushing back away from the, the pressure that she felt from me. And then when she would act badly, you know, just sort of like, I don't know, I don't know what you mean, I don't know, you know, just kind of in this, I would sort of ally with the teacher and be like, Jane, this is what she means, blah, 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 blah. be kind of condescending and annoying. So... <laughs> Anyway, this is a long answer. I just started seeing more that she feels like this doesn't belong to her. She feels somewhat ganged up on and I'm a part of this problem. So I started getting more humble, calming myself down more, starting to realize I'm doing something to her that I don't think is okay, don't think it's good. It's something I recognize in my parents that I am doing instinctively and so I have to stop doing that. So I started to get more into that in my own psyche. And then I started having conversations with her and about it more. And we got much more able to solve it. She first started saying things like when she was young at the time, like maybe nine at the time that I was starting to put this together. And she was saying things from a nine year old perspective, but they were pointing to it. She said, I don't like it when the teacher says this and then you agree with her. So my first response, my my immature response is like, well, why shouldn't I be able to agree with her if what she's saying is right? <laughs> my wiser response is, you know, she's pointing to this feeling that I'm not on her, on her team and that there is pressure on her that she now wants to rebel against. So the more I got settled down and self-confronted, the more she could talk to me honestly about it, the more I could so problem solve it with her uh, there was also something in the dynamic with the teacher that honestly wasn't really working well. And even in our attempts, my attempts to talk to the teacher about it, it just wasn't self-correcting enough. And I'm not blaming the teacher. She was great, really. I, I just think that it was a pattern that was too hard to break. And so we ended up changing teachers. I was taking a very different position in me that was more grown up in me. And it just hasn't happened since. She just really grew out of that and was able to occupy a different position. I hope that story was helpful. It didn't even have any like that story. But that's, that's the process and it always starts with self-confrontation. What would it be like to be in relationship to me? How am I a part of this problem? How am I creating anxiety here that I can't even track or recognize? Um, and when you start calming down in that way, it wasn't just that my behavior changed that was infecting her less, but I was in a more honest, open position. She knew she could talk to me more. She knew she could start to think about it herself. And that gave her more room to belong to her own life and take some deeper responsibility for herself as well. Okay, so I'm gonna just, okay. 
you're welcome. I'm glad. I'm glad that's a helpful example. Um, okay. So let me just, I'm going to skip a few of those questions um, just because I'm getting worried about the time. Um, but let me just say a few more things about this. So, you know, again, the way you get better at things is you step towards the things you're not good at. And the way you feel more self-efficacious, more self-respect is walking towards the things that are hard for you. And we live in an environment that's always distracting us from that. I think it's really unhealthy. I mean, mental health and amount of time in nature are correlated for a reason because there's more soul time. There's more time to be in your own thoughts. There's more time for a spirituality to emerge. When we're constantly running from, you know, screen to screen to, you know, task to task, it's very hard to develop that. I, you know, when I was young, I was socially awkward, really very much so. I'm really grateful that the only distractions I had back then were Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch. And once they were over, there wasn't a lot left to do. <laughs> so there was more time to kind of figure out who do I want to be and I want to get better at this. And, you know, there wasn't as much to pull you away from a natural organic process of getting stronger. So, um, so I think that normalizing that for your child but helping them to track it so that they have more ability to resist it and then help it you can help them by seeing you do it having times of pause in your family times for self-reflection time for walks time for uh time out in nature um the second idea quickly is that there is so much shame around sexuality right um and pornography in particular that we can make it really uh, burdensome. We can actually make it more punctuated by the fact that we obsess about its negativity. And one of the ways that we obsess about its negativity is we have the idea that the behavior itself is the controlling agent, that the pornography drags the person from decency into debauchery. And that, um, you know, that your sexuality is a corrosive agent. And I think when we frame it up that way, the amount of fear and anxiety is so high, um, and the terror, if we know our child's been looking at it, that we, we really make ourselves and our child less able to deal with it. So the more you can normalize, well, first of all, it's normal that you like to look at naked people, okay? That makes you a human being. It's normal that you're curious about it. Um, it doesn't make you strange. And you know, think about it, our kids are hearing all kinds of things. It's normal that they want to go Google it and figure out what that means. They don't dare ask you. So it's not strange, it makes them human. If you think back on your own childhood, you know, you add your own curiosity, you're trying to figure things out. Uh, and so you don't want to shame it because you supercharge it when you do, and you make it more likely for them to um, have an ambivalent, but stronger desire to go and indulge in that behavior it, it actually makes it feel i don't know how to say it but like it, get, it makes it more compelling than just normalizing it it's more like oh yeah no of course you like sweets that's normal of course you like cheetos like that's normal they've been designed to make you like them okay but the bigger question is what's going to make your life better and what's going to bless your life and not keeping the eye on the thing you should stay away from, but putting your eyes towards what it is you wanna create. And I talk about this a lot in the How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex, is you're helping them for, uh, forge an idea about where it is they wanna go, who it is they wanna become, and to put their eyes in that direction rather than not having any of the negative thoughts or feelings or behaviors. You're gonna have them. Um, you know, the, the difference between depressed people and less depressed people, one important difference is the people that tend to go towards depression get obsessive about their negative thoughts or their negative behaviors. They really will beat themselves up about their presence. Less depressed people are like, oh yeah, you know, I thought that antisocial thought, I did that thing that wasn't great, but they kind of keep moving their eyes towards what it is. Okay, I don't know what happened. It just suddenly turned off, so... Hopefully you can all see me again. Once, I'll just wait for somebody to confirm that they do, but I'll, so anyway, so let me just, um... 
So again, you just want to help your children point in the right direction. It's, uh, you know, again, it's not whether or not somebody is playing video games, for example. It's whether or not is the video game a way to escape their life or is it the icing on the cake of a good life? That's the real issue. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm back. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. And again, reminding your children that they are stronger than any of these things. That while, yes, sexuality is compelling, food is compelling, video games is compelling, anything you can immediately get that reward, it's compelling. Uh, but you're stronger than it, meaning you, we say it a little differently than that, you can make decisions to create what you want in your life and then make decisions about what your relationship will be to those things. I read an article recently called, I can't remember what it was called, but it's basically that the idea of self-control is an illusion, that you only have so much self-control, but you can make decisions that make it easier to engage in the life you want so that you're not constantly having to say no to things that are bombarding you. Uh, you can say, I'm gonna cut these things out, I choose it, because I don't wanna have to constantly be in a struggle around what I'm gonna do around this and you can live your life more deliberately in that sense by trying to fulfill the, the higher desire that resides within you. Okay, I wanna quickly get to the second question. Um, the, this was sort of three questions in one that I'll take up quickly, but one person wrote, everyone talks about moms doing what they like and I don't even know what it is that I like or want. Another person said, how and where do I start on a journey to a career? And a third person says, um, how do I handle the mom guilt and be okay with doing things that I like outside of kids and family? Okay, so let me just make a response to all of those. Um, so everyone talks about moms doing what they like, but I don't even know what I like or want. I mean, the first thing I would say about that is that it's okay not to know. I mean, as I talk about in the Art of Desire course, there is so many of us who've grown up with the idea that having desires as a female makes you less feminine. That, and I think some biological wiring, somewhat to be very attuned to and intelligent about mapping other people. The problem with that is that what other people want from you can bombard and interfere with you knowing your own desires or making room for them. So when you say <clears throat> you don't know what you like, I mean, I would say that's okay. Um, but what I would say is just starting to make room for your interests, starting to make room for what it is that might uh, be enriching to you or interesting to you is a really important process or reality. And so um, it's more that you're opening up room for your own development than knowing what that is. I think one of the ideas that really interferes is that there is some hidden passion within us that we must discover or that there is a path God wants us to walk on that we have to sort out because I think when we have it in the idea that it's in static form and we've got to dig around and find it it actually interferes with a creative reflexive process that's much more important in our development and while I think we do have inherited talents, you know, that is to say proclivities or capacities or interests, they're native. They're, they, I mean, they're, they're, uh, what's the word I want? They're, they're young. They're, they're just, um, early in development. And there's a lot of ways that you can develop and make a positive difference in the world, right? As, um, is talked about in the Doctrine and Covenants, this idea of being, not being commanded in all things, being anxiously engaged in a good cause. And so I think that um, one way, okay, there's a lot to say here. Um, going to the sort of the second question, I'll kind of blend them into one. The idea of kind of how do I discover what my best career is or what's gonna make me most happy. While I think interest inventories are, are valuable on some level, kind of knowing what you naturally like, again, I would have never, at 16 when I was being given some of those in high school, never ever would have said being a sex therapist, okay? I barely could conceive of the idea that I would be working with adults because I wasn't an adult myself. So I was thinking I'd be a child therapist because I could relate to them. <laughs> uh, so 
the, the, while interest can tell you something, I think that the people that really find um, their careers to be gratifying have found a way to do something valuable in the world, to find a need that exists and to develop capacities and bring capacities that can respond to a need that exists. And I think, you know, human beings, um, I, let me see, I, this is a, you know, a, you know, this is a quote of somebody, but I don't even know who said it. A person's true wealth is in the good that they do in the world, right? And Martin Seligman, who's a psychologist, and uh, he wrote um, in his book, I think called Flourish, he said what, you know, what basically paraphrasing that what really helps people be satisfied in their lives is mastery and meaning. So mastery is working hard to get good at something, okay, but everyone here could be good at many, many, many different things. So, but it's getting good at something and then doing something that makes the world a better place. And I think, you know, that again, it's that reflexive process of like what is needed and what skills do I desire to develop to, you know, what is the need that I want to be able to respond to that has enough intrinsic interest to me that I want to develop the skills to possibly respond to that. And as you start to walk down that path, it will teach you more about yourself and also teach you more about what's needed. And then you may start walking in a different direction, but that is an important process. You know, I started out thinking I'm not smart enough to get a PhD, that's for people, and, and I'm not, I maybe shouldn't because I should get married or whatever. And so I thought, you know, I'll be um, either an interior designer or an architect because I like that and, and that fit more my idea about what would be an appropriate degree to get as a female because that's how I thought at that time. Um, I liked it, I valued it, but you know, the more I walked down that path, the more I thought, no, I really want to help people that are in need. So I changed it to psychology. And then, you know, as I started walking down that path, I could see there was more of the need around relationships. And so I thought I'd really want to be a good marriage therapist. I started walking down that path. I could see, especially in the LDS community, there's a real need around sexuality. And so it was more that I was developing skills, but then needs were presenting themselves that would then push my own development in directions that were in response. It wasn't that I inherently wanted to be a sex therapist is that I was in response to a need that I wanted to create the capacity to respond to. So again, I think, you know, people's satisfaction with their lives is much more to do with their sense that they can make a meaningful difference in whatever circle that they choose and develop skills that allow them to do that. But again, I wouldn't think of it as static. I would think of it as a process and tolerating that your own failure is fundamental to it. That you will be trying things that don't work out, but you learn something from your process, from the process of it not working out. And you get maybe a better idea about what you really do like in that or what you think you could offer. Um, it also exposes you to the world to be more able to see where there's need. And so that process is a meaningful and important one. Um, and one not to think, you know, to, not to bring perfectionism to but more creativity and, and tolerance too. The last question I'll quickly answer is, is um, how do I handle mom guilt uh, and start being more okay with doing things that I like outside of kids and family? Well, I, I think the simple response to that is that the best way to be a mother is to be a whole person. The best way to be a parent is to not have your sense of self be hinged upon your child. And, you know, that's what I was doing with my daughter was her being a good musician was something that had something to do with me and that it was infecting her ability to belong to her own life and her own desires and her own capacities. So what I had to confront was the issues of myself were playing out with her and I had to stop doing that to her. Um, and so self-development, you never, Again, this is issue of like your peace is going to be with knowing that you have developed capacities within you that make a meaningful difference in the world. So it is inherently a self and relationship reality. How do I handle that with integrity that the people I'm in connection with thrive and that I also thrive? So you don't want to be doing things for yourself that undermine your children's well-being. 
You don't want to do things that are in betrayal of your responsibility to them. But you also don't want to betray your own development because that will make them pay too. If a parent doesn't deal with her own development, uh, your children will be managing your sense of self, uh, whether or not they know it and whether or not they like it, right? So the more that a child can trust that you have a handle on your life, um, the more they can take up the issue of their own life. So um, I hope this has been helpful and sorry for the disruption there. Um, I don't think there's any announcements I'm supposed to make. <laughs> But uh, um, I'm glad you all have all been here and I will see you probably in about three more weeks. We'll do another Facebook Live based on different questions that have come into the group. So I um, hope you're all doing well, hope you're staying healthy and hope you're all working to bring your best selves to your relationships, including your relationship with yourself. All right, you're welcome everybody and I will talk to you soon. Bye.